Hello, this lecture is titled Revivalism. Revivalism, revivalism is a good place to start to better understand the fundamentalism of the 20th century. 19th century rev revivalism, first in the rural frontier and later in urban centers, shaped biblical Christianity of the 20th century. The fundamentalist movement was closely linked to revival activity of the past and present. At revival meetings, listeners heard biblical truth untampered by liberal seminarians and theologians. In the late 1800s, popular evangelist Dwight L. Moody declared, quote, I see every once in a while in the paper somebody attacks my theology. They say I belong to the last century that my theology is 100 years old. If it were not nearly 1900 years old, I would throw it into the fire and burn it up. Moody and like-minded evangelicals could be said to be fundamentalists before the term was coined. These proto-fundamentalists were soul winners who upheld the inerrancy of the Bible. In the first half of the 19th century, evan evangelical denominations grew rapidly. There's no airtight def definition for evangelicalism, but historian David Bebbington identifies four key components of evangelicalism. Conversionism, which is an emphasis on the new birth as a life-changing religious experience. Biblicism, a reliance on the Bible as ultimate religious authority, activism, a concern for spreading the faith, and crucicentrism, which is a focus on Christ's redeeming work on the cross. Evangelical growth was linked to revivalism. Christian churches had always witnessed periods of revivals. What was noteworthy was the degree that evangelical revivalism shaped American church, culture, and society. It was more democratic than in other nations where an established church dominated. In America, many evangelical denominations grew out of and participated in revivalism. This was counter-establishment and appeared to represent, quote, the old idea of American innocence versus European corruption. In Europe, one church often dominated the religious expression of a nation. For example, the Church of England held sway in British culture, and such a church-state arrangement suggested that other Christian denominations were of a lesser category. Revival is easily defined. One historian of revivalism writes that the, quote, the essential characteristic of revival is that it assumes some sort of decline, whether real or imagined, out of which the faithful are called to new heights of spiritual ardor and commitment, end of quote. The focus of evangelicalism and revivalism is on personal salvation. Decision is between the individual and God. Church institutional bonds were loosened when revival meetings were held in fields, barns, and other buildings rather than in churches. In 19th century America, the most successful evangelical denomination was Methodism. It went from being a small religious society of less than 5,000 members in the year 1776 to become the largest single denomination in 1850 with 2.6 million members. The Methodists quickly made great gains, whereas more mainline denominations did not effectively adapt to a mobile social order. Baptists likewise made great gains in memberships. 
But Episcopalian, formerly known as Church of England, and Congregationalist churches failed to mark to match the progress of Methodism. The Methodists were less fettered. For example, Methodist activity did not require a well-educated and well-paid clergy since Methodist congregation, known as classes, were usually served by local unpaid preachers. These amateurs came from the ranks of the common people and thus were in tune with the various needs of ordinary folk. In addition to local pastors, there were the itinerant preachers who might ride three-month circuits which linked various classes. Thus, you would have these traveling preachers representing, uh, linking the various uh, congregations. Uh, one example of a circuit rider was Methodist Peter Cartwright. <clears throat> Cartwright had visited far-flung settlements and he was one of many who, who preached to scattered homesteads far from urban centers. Cartwright wrote of the independence, self-reliance, and toughness of traveling Methodist preachers. Quote, he went through storms of wind, hail, snow, and rain, climbed hills and mountains, traversed valleys, plunged through swamps, swam swollen streams, lay out all night, wet, weary, and hungry. He slept with a saddle blanket for a bed, his saddle or saddle bags for his pillow, and his old big coat or blanket, if he had any, for a covering. He took with this with a hearty zest, deer or bear meat, or wild turkey for breakfast, dinner, and supper, if he could get it." End of quote. Cartwright's own assessment was that the Methodist pioneer preachers were among the best men, quote, ever called of God to plant Methodism in this holy, happy republic, especially in our mighty West, end of quote. Settlers had hardly finished building their homes when the traveling Methodist preachers arrived to preach a, a message of sin and salvation. The itinerants did not require a well-populated and flourishing settlement. As ministers of the gospel, the Methodists suited, quote, people who wanted a preacher that could mount a stump, a block or log, and without note or manuscript, quote, expound and apply the word of God to the hearts and consciousness of the people. End of quote. The earthy, emotional tone of camp meetings captured the attention of rural settlers seeking to be right with God. One early 19th century Methodist wrote of religious life in the hinterland. It was seldom we had any preaching, but if a traveling preacher should come along and make an appointment, all would go out to preaching." End of quote. Peter Cartwright, for example, could attract a great mass of people from many counties, hundred miles round. The Civil War, shook the nation from 1861 to 1865. What followed were dramatic changes, including the growth of new cities, but also the increased population of the older cities. Cities were growing. The United States went from a small town and countryside culture to a culture shaped by cities. In the urban setting, some city clergymen began to offer a more liberal message that took a less literal reading of the Bible. Clergy such as Henry Ward Beecher, 
did not want to upset the sensibilities of his urban audience, particularly those of higher culture. Those who preached the so-called new theology believed it was important to avoid talk of eternal punishment for sinners. Jonathan Blanchard, well-known pastor and college president, wrote in 1872 that, quote, the American churches have drunk and are still drinking the, still drinking the poison of Henry Ward Beecher's teachings. Blanchard asked, if Mr. Beecher's teachings are the gospel of Christ, what need had Christ to be crucified? Blanchard's son, Charles, who later became president of Wheaton College, took the lesson of history that a Christian institution that was biblical would have the opposition of the world. He took to heart the words of 19th century evangelist Charles Grandison Finney, quote, now we are really too popular. The world does not hate us anymore. You need not be worried when the world hates you, end of quote. Charles Blanchard's favorite texts included, quote, having no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. So again, the message was have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Another one of Blanchard's texts, favorite text was, quote, come out from among them and be separate. End of quote. Such thinking foreshadowed the emergence of fundament fundamentalism later in the, once we get into the 20th century. Those who maintain the fundamentals of biblical Christianity oppose any acceptance of Darwinianism, higher criticism, and comparative religion. These proto-fundamentalists, that is, fundamentalists before the term was coined, favored a blending of theological conservatism with a particular individualistic approach to social action. The industrial urban experience of the late 19th century provided new employment opportunities and a higher standard of living for everyone. But there were challenges particularly for unskilled workers living in crowded housing. Proto-fundamentalists believed that salvation of individuals was the ultimate cure of, social, of societal problems. The best known proto-fundamentalist was Dwight L. Moody. Moody was born in 1837 in rural Massachusetts. He became a Christian at age 17 and for the next number of years kept an exhausting pace, teaching Sunday school, organizing meetings, raising funds, recruiting people, and participating in Christian conventions. By 1873, he took up revivalism full time with intense devotion, employing hymn singer Ira David Sankey. Sankey accompanied him to the British Isles for two years of revival meetings, beginning in Scotland and then to Irish and English cities. Moody and Sankey wakened great Christian interest within the church and community. The masses of people which Moody and Sankey attracted were phenomenal. Moody's successful work in the British Isles caused his popularity to grow in North America before he set foot on American soil in 1875. Those two years in the British Isles, the word got out back, back home. And many Americans were excited to have him preach 
in their city. Until his death in 1899, Moody held major revival meetings in urban centers throughout the United States and even north of the border in Canada. Established in this period, the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago would later align itself with the 20th century fundamentalist movement. If Moody could be said to have a theology, it was evangelical in a broad sense of the word, ruined by sin, redemption by Christ, and regeneration by the Holy Spirit. His message was nothing but the old, old story told with a directness, simplicity, and pathos that went straight to the heart. The simplicity of Moody's sermons was not surprising considering his attitude towards higher education and modern thought. He stated that if he had the choice, he would rather have O and O, meaning out and out Christian, after his name rather than D, D. That is, he was not interested in having doctor of divinity behind his name. Having no theological schooling and not bound to any particular denomination of doctrine, it seemed that the only thing which was certain about Moody's doctrinal position was that he believed in the unchanging truth of scripture. Speaking against liberal Protestantism, which held ground at this point in only a few circles, wasn't until later on into the closer to the turn of the century that we see the liberal processes and new theology taking, taking hold. But in the 1870s, it had yet to require, acquire a strong voice. But Moody stated, quote, I want to say right here that I have no new gospel or new theology and have yet to find a man who has accomplished much that has, end of quote. In his eyes, an evangelical message was timeless, never out of date. Moody's focus was on soul winning, and he rarely reflected on social, intellectual, or scientific questions. Historian Kathleen Boone's work on the discourse of fundamentalists and their support for biblical inerrancy and dismissal of secular constructs indicates that their attitudes were far from irrational. Rejecting subjectivism and relativism, Moody embraced a rational comprehension of the Bible that upheld the determinacy of meaning in biblical text. In other words, Determined by God, biblical meaning did not change. Moody often made his conservative evangelicalism clear, telling his audience to accept every portion of the Bible. Ministers who used higher criticism on scripture were taking a road that led to an empty gospel. In Germany, in particular, there were scholars who adopted biblical criticism that questioned the historicity of the Gospels. Moody preached that the Bible is true from Genesis to Revelation, and those who disbelieved any part of Scripture were misguided. Tampering with the Bible was the work of the devil. Moody preached that a Christianity not based on a literal interpretation of the Bible had little chance to convict people of their sins. If people rejected various parts of the Bible, before long they might reject Christ's resurrection. In connection with his literal interpretation of the Bible, Moody occasionally spoke on the issue of hell and on this topic, there was no mistaking his traditional, old-school, orthodox conservatism. 
he lamented that ministers, quote, of today are afraid of offending cultured people. Never give the naked gospel, never mention hell. They are not like vulgar common people. They want a different gospel, end of quote. Well, to this issue, Moody said that every individual, quote, must either give up his sin or go to heaven or hold on to them and go to hell, end of quote. Moody stressed that all face the wrath and the law of God and the three steps to hell for everyone were neglect, refuse, and despise. Proto-fundamentalists like Moody had little patience for ministers who insisted on softening the message of the Bible. Quote, if you have one who tones down God's message and his oily tongue, he is a devil sent minister. He will cheat you out of heaven if you do not look out. End of quote. As the story in Kathleen Boone notes, quote, if the power of any discourse derives in some measure from the quantity and quality of fear it can still in its subjects, fundamentalism is a supremely powerful in its doctrine of the everlasting conscious torment suffered by the unsaved in the literal files, fires of hell. The proto-fundamentalist Moody found it impossible to accept that God was merciful to condemn murderers and other, uh, others uh, who carried out evil acts. For Moody, such reasoning suggested that God had drowned in the flood the entire wicked world and took them to heaven, leaving a faithful Noah to wade through the destruction. Moody saw the world as wicked, but he had little interest in social matters outside the experiences of family life. For Moody, the poor treatment of women often was a result of alcohol abuse by males, and while he did not openly promote a temperance agenda, he targeted the sin of alcohol abuse. In fact, Late 19th century temperance unions approached the issue of temperance as a religious issue and not exclusively a social one. Moody delivered touching illustrations about women and children being the innocent victims of drunkenness and the importance of alcoholic husbands becoming born again. He told his listeners that families should rely on the Bible for guidance. Wretchedness and misery had come into so many families because they did not follow biblical teachings. His understanding of family life followed his belief that a proper Christian home provided the direction for children to become upstanding citizens. He was often conscious of the role that a godly family played in the stability of the community, something achieved through Bible reading him singing, and family prayer in the home. Like many proto-fundamentalists, he emphasized the critical role played by the mother in religious nurture. For Moody, providing religious direction for young people was especially important by the late 19th century because dancing halls and dime store novels were only two of many amusements that diverted young people from church activities. There was a culture denying component in his conservative message and the youth in particular required, so the youth required protection from modern evil forces. Moody understood the, that the city could dissolve social and religious bonds, and he often directed his audience to replace the missing moral influence of the young person's home. As mentioned earlier, Moody preached that the only realistic solution to the problem of societal strife 
was to target people's sinful hearts with the gospel. As he saw it, one was to sympathize with others and rely on God's power to realize and improve society. Distance himself from the social gospel movement that was gaining strength among some ministers in the United States and Canada, and for that matter, in the British Isles, Moody told his listeners that clergymen were not to preach science, literature, and social reform. Rather, their mission was to preach sin and salvation since the world could not survive without Christ. Moody declare, declared, quote, there is so much talk of reform, 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 till I am sick of the whole thing. What is wanted is to preach Christ in season and out of season. End of quote. He understood that the building of a kingdom of God on earth was impossible to achieve because all people were corrupt. He preached, quote, we are naturally bad. Who in this audience would be willing to have his heart photographed with all his real thoughts and passions brought to life? End of quote. He desired that individuals reach for Christ's kingdom. But the kingdom he referred to was not a kingdom of God on earth, but it was almost exclusively the kingdom of heaven. Moody endorsed a pre-millennial understanding of end times. That is, the belief that the millennium, or 1,000 years of righteousness, could only begin with the physical arrival of Jesus. And Moody urged the churches to preach of the second coming. He argued that churches, unfortunately, were negligent in, in their fail to preach the second coming of Christ. His pessimism was contrary to the optimism of post-millennialism that many 19th century Parsons had accepted post-millennialism was certainly involved, certainly was popular from the early years of the United States. So from after the American Revolution all the way up to the Civil War was very popular. But after the Civil War, there were an increasing number of Christians adopting the uh, pre premillennial understanding of end times. Well, it was impossible, impossible for mankind to usher in an era of goodness that would continue for 1,000 years, followed by the return of Christ. Moody once believed that the world would become better, but changed his mind, accepting it was only going to get worse until Christ's return. To listeners, he declared, quote, we have lost spiritual life by being hand in glove with the world, believers unequally yoked with unbelievers. Quote, end of quote. Christians were to, were to lead a separate life on the basis that Christ taught that the world was at war with him. And yet Moody did engage the world, representing the tension of being separate of the world, but also reaching out to the unsaved. Referring to Moody's extensive and successful preaching in and outside the United States, one critic admitted that, quote, all in all, it is very probable, probably true, as his admirers claim, that he reduced the population of hell by a million souls. End of quote. To be theologically correct, it was the work of the Holy Spirit, but certainly Moody's proto fundamentalist message reached countless millions. 
To conclude, I will list a number of important themes of proto-fundamentalism. First, there was complete disagreement with Darwinism and evolutionary science these uh, proto-fundamentalists. And again, the term proto referring to fundamentalists who uh, lived before the actual term was coined. It wasn't, we didn't see that term coined till after 1915. So complete rejection of Darwinism and evolutionary science. There was also, a wariness concerning higher education. And this was because of higher criticism, the various scholars that had, in, had been influenced, in particular in Germany, ones who began to question the literal truth of the Bible. In addition, Another important theme of proto-fundamentalism was the opposition to social gospel teaching. Social gospel teaching. They did not think it was the role of pastors to be in, involved in social issues. There's still too many people needing to hear the gospel. The proto-fundamentalists embrace premillennialism. With proto-fundamentalism, there was also a focus on the family and the importance of following biblical teaching. And these themes would pop up during Moody's revival meetings. Proto-fundamentalists also saw modern culture as a significant threat to the life of the church. So they were presenting the position that the church had to be on guard and be weary of modern culture and how it would clash and, and with the church and threaten threaten the life of the church. Proto-fundamentalists did not attempt to soften the topic of an everlasting hell. Also, most of the proto-fundamentalist leaders came out of the Northeast United States. And remarkably, the early 20th century fundamentalists, many of them were educated individuals from the Northeast, which is kind of corrects the notion that fundamentalists were just rural folk, even folk from the South or the mid US, people who were unsophisticated, not, edu not educated and, and and this was certainly not the case. Many fundamentalists were actually very well educated. Finally, the popularity of revival meetings covered by the press, by the popular press, revealed that countless Americans were supportive of the biblical truth of the proto-fundamentalists. So just to wrap things up then, to have a better understanding of 20th century fundamentalism, one needs to go back and take a look uh, at the major themes of revivals that took place out in the rural areas, in the frontier, but also in the urban settings. And whether it was out on the hinterland or in the urban center, the message of these evangelists, these revivalists, was really a message of sin and salvation. And their primary focus was on soul winning. 
Thank you.